Uh, good evening. I'd like to thank you all for coming, and it's a pleasure to see you all here tonight and share this opportunity to learn more about the wildlife that we share our beautiful area with. As director of the Randall Library, I always relish the chance to help people self-educate, and tonight's subject offers a great educational opportunity. Believe me when I say people come to the library all the time asking about this particular subject. Um, it can sometimes be challenging as humans to balance our desire to live in a rural environment with the needs of the wildlife that we share that environment with. But I believe that we can learn to peacefully strike that balance by learning more about each other and to live by the words by, of Mahatma Gandhi who once said, the greatness of a nation is judged by the way it treats its animals. Tonight's presentation provides a chance to combine the services of the Randall Library and the other departments and committees through town, and I'm very grateful for that. Keep in mind that if you're interested in continuing your learning experience at the end of the evening, feel free to stop by the Randall Library and the staff there will be pleased to help you learn, get books and articles available on the subject through the Minuteman Library Network. And also check out our website to learn more about any upcoming events that you might be interested in. Um, we did uh, something similar to this quite a few years ago and it was actually really well received and so make sure that you're checking our website to see what other upcoming events we have. So thank you very much. But my name is Sandra Grund, and I am on the Conservation Commission as a volunteer, and I also work in the environmental field um, as a career. And so tonight I'm here just as a volunteer and also as a Conservation Commission member um, to talk about wildlife in our woods and specifically um, predators. So I'll be um, doing a bit of an introduction into tonight, and then I'll talk about who's going to be following me, and then at the end we're going to have a little question and answer session. So tonight's goals, well, um, this talk came about, and I know Melissa had mentioned that this has been done in the past, but we thought it was time to do another one because, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of questions have been coming up again about the different wildlife as people see them around town. And um, we also noticed that through social media, like uh, nextdoor.com, that there, it's a great way to... Um, I don't know if all of you have heard of it, but it's a great tool to kind of connect communities. And we've seen a lot of questions about wildlife on there and discussions and some good information and some misinformation that seemed to be um, making way onto there. So we thought it, this was a good opportunity and a good reason to try and gather the community together and talk a little bit about it. Um, the goals of tonight are to learn about coyotes, uh, to help everybody learn about coyotes and other predators that are commonly found in Stowe. We also wanted to talk about ways that you can minimize conflict and try and encourage a peaceful coexistence with the wildlife in, their wood, in our woods. <coughs> and also, at the end, we're just going to do, like I said, a little question and answer um, time so that you can ask questions about curiosities that you have or concerns. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Sandra Grund, and tonight we have two volunteers, myself and Mark, that aren't, you know, staff for the town. And we also have two staff, or three staff that are here, including Melissa, um, <coughs> that are going to be talking about this topic. So um, after myself, Kathy Svera, who many of you probably know, she is the conservation coordinator for the town of Stowe, and she's going to talk a little bit about the behavior and ecology of predators in town. Um, after that, Mark Roberts, who's from Eco Policy Advisors, he, um, and I forgot to mention a little bit of a background about all of us. Um, Mark has a degree from McGill University in biology and has spent his life protecting species and working with endangered species and climate change. So he's been working to protect the environment for most of his career. And um, Kathy's background is a degree in environmental education and field natural history that she got from Cornell University. And myself, I have a master's in environmental management from the University of New South Wales in Australia. And I also work in the environmental field and have done a lot with uh, federal, state, local, tribal governments and um, consultancies to work with ecosystems and species and natural resources. And lastly, um, Phyllis Tower, who's our animal control officer, will be talking a bit about um, useful tips for pet safety and, and wildlife in town. So I'm just going to go a little bit, kind of give the big picture 
and just talk about Stowe and then this is all, ba a lot of it is very basic and many of you probably know this but I thought it would be nice to kind of just have a big picture look at Stowe and then um, ecosystems. So Stowe, as we all know, is located in an incredibly populated region of the country and uh, there's a lot of development pressure in town. I grew up in Burlington and have seen just the transformation you know, as of a town closer to Boston and how we're just getting pushed out and pushed out and pushed out and how it really can transform a town. But, you know, Stowe has done a really good job of being able to maintain a small town flavor. And, and a lot of people move here because they love that small town flavor. They love what we have here. And then we also get a lot of visitors in town and take advantage of some of the agriculture that we offer and, and it's a good way to ge generate revenue for businesses in town. Um, you know, we have trails, open space, farmland, etc. Um, I was just talking to somebody in town that was saying the exact same thing. They're not in the environmental field, but they just feel like a lot of people do that part of the beauty of living in Stowe is it ha having nature right around us. Um, <clears throat> so a lot we hear the term ecosystem all the time and it's it's you know we all kind of think you know I know what it is but if somebody actually asked you what is it you know could you describe it and so basically an ecosystem is a group of living and non-living things that are interacting in a system so this is a biological system and it contains a food web in the different ways that the organisms within, within that food web interact um, uh, as you, many of you know, each, each of these things has a very unique role, and their role really helps maintain the health of a system. And predators also have a very unique role in that system. Um, living things, for example, would be you know, plants, animals, trees, and insects. Non-living things is the water, um, the soil, the atmosphere, the weather. Um, and the, these systems can be affected by disturbances, they can be affected by biodiversity, they can be affected by secession, <coughs> and they can all kind of have impacts on an ecosystem. In terms of predators, which is, wow, that was really loud. In terms of predators, which is the focus of tonight, um, predators naturally prey on other animals to survive. They have a symbiotic relationship. So for instance, if you have a ra high rabbit population, that can provide a great food source for foxes. And then the fox population will increase because of that energy in, that they're receiving from the rabbits. But then the next year, you might have a lower rabbit population and a higher fox population. So it's kind of can be cyclical, and there's a very symbiotic relationship between a lot of the organisms in the system. Predators sometimes get the bad guy reputation, but they really, like I said, play a great role in helping maintain a healthy ecosystem. Um, they help regulate prey populations. They help maintain biodiversity by preventing a single species from really becoming too abundant. They also can help maintain um, the health of plants in the system and reduce habitat damage should, for instance, a herbivore uh, population just explode. Okay, so um, next Kathy's going to talk about behavior and ecology of four of the um, local fur-bearing predators. She's going to say five because that's two types of foxes. But <laughs> so good evening and thank you. Um, I am going to talk about some of the wildlife in our woods and specifically five predators that are part of the nature that surrounds us. So these are coyotes red foxes, gray foxes, bobcats, and fishers. The genesis of this presentation really was a conversation on social media on the next door site in which someone commented, these animals are not your friends. And I responded that they are not my friends, nor are they my enemies, but they are part of the nature which I respect, appreciate, and seek to understand. And that is really the theme for tonight. My hope is that you will learn more about all of these animals and that your own curiosity will be kindled and also that you will leave with knowledge that may help you correct some of the misperceptions that are out there about these creatures and appreciate the importance of peaceably coexisting with the wildlife that surrounds us. My own interest in coyotes began in part when we at the Conservation Commission had a report of a coyote attack on a dog 
that had happened at one of our conservation areas about two years ago. The attack happened in June. The dog was off leash and uh, appropriately so in that place. Um, followed a scent trail and was confronted by a coyote that was displaying these classic defensive postures. Um, it stood up on a stone wall, it arched its back, it growled at the dog, and the dog continued, unmindful of the warning, and the coyote lunged at it and bit it on the hindquarters. That is just classic coyote defensive behavior. And the owner was concerned that the coyote might be sick, that the coyote might have rabies. He reported that the coyote smelled. They don't bathe a lot in the winter. Um, and our hunch was that the coyote was probably defending pups, but we really didn't know. And uh, just about two weeks later, we had a report from a nearby landowner that there were four coyote pups hanging out in a farm field. And you can see them circled in the bottom of the slide. And our suspicions were confirmed. Um, I had been playing around with a trail camera on my own property, and so with the owner's permission, we placed three trail cameras in the woods near the field to see if we could capture some better photos of the pups. And I was stunned the first day that I went out to download the pictures from the camera and found these photos of the pups. We had kids! <laughs> And literally, the very first two pictures that my new camera took were the two on the top of the slide. So we got very lucky. And since then, I've had a number of cameras that have moved around Stowe. I've had the opportunity to observe this pack of coyotes for the last two years, and also some of the other animals that are the subject of this presentation. So most, but not all, of the photos in this presentation are taken from the trail cameras. So I'm going to start talking a little bit about coyotes. In Massachusetts and in the Northeast, the coyote that you see is called the Eastern Coyote. It's found across the state everywhere except on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, and it's much larger than its western cousin, the Western Coyote. The, um, genetically, the Eastern Coyote is actually a hybrid between the wolf, the Western Coyote, and a dog. And um, the eastern coyote began colonizing northern New England from Canada in the 1930s and really had moved into Massachusetts by the 1950s. Um, the state now believes that the population is stable with about 2,000 to 4,000 coyotes across the state of Massachusetts. And the eastern coyote is sometimes also known as the coy wolf. Um, there's a lot of debate and controversy among wolf biologists about what they're most appropriately called. Tonight, we're just going to call them coyotes, but those are the eastern coyotes that we see. The average female coyote weighs in at about 35 pounds. The average male is about 40 pounds. Um, 55 pounds is record for an eastern coyote here, so if you hear somebody saying, you know, I saw an 80-pound coyote, mm. <laughs> not likely. Um, the coyote is about five feet long from nose to tip of tail. Um, the um, coyotes grow this really thick winter coat every year. And so they look much larger in the winter. And they look, in, I think, much more wolf-like in the winter. Um, you can see in these pictures the coyote in the on the top was taken in August. The one on the bottom was taken in March. So that's that difference in the thickness of the coat. And then this slide gives you a comparison of the coyote to other animals um, on the top, sitting sort of squarely between a golden retriever and a border collie. Um, and then the comparison with the red fox at the end of the picture. On the bottom, you can see how much larger a wolf is than a coyote. Um, and then also the comparison to a gray fox that we'll be talking about. The coat color on coyotes can vary tremendously from blonde to red to gray to brown. Um, it's fairly common for coyotes to have a black tail tip, but as you can see from these slides, that's not always the case. Um, they have yellowish brown eyes, and again, you can see the difference in the summer and winter coat from the top slides to the bottom slides, both top taken in the summer, both bottom taken in the winter. A group of coyotes is referred to as a pack, 
and a pack is a family unit. Um, a pack typically contains four to eight coyotes. And the pack is made up of an alpha female and an alpha male, which typically mate for life. That is unusual in the animal kingdom. They are assisted by one to three helper or beta coyotes, and then they also will have the juveniles or the pups with them in any given year. The helper coyotes are generally a few coyotes from last year's litter that have stayed around to help gather food and um, take care of the pups when they're born. You know, some kids just don't leave home, and those are the, um, the betas or the helpers. And um, the alpha female plays a very key role in the pack. She is the disciplinarian. She is the one who keeps order, who really plays a lead role in teaching the pups how to hunt. And importantly, she prevents the other females in the pack from mating. Mm -mm, not happening here. Um, and that is because those other females would create additional pups that would creep, compete with her pups for food. So that's not happening. During mating season, which um, we are pretty much just at the end of right now, um, the alpha pair will typically travel together with the male following the female. And um, this video shows what I believe to be an alpha pair, if I can get it to play. Come on. Um, this, so, some of you have seen our, our otter cam, and these are at the otter cam site. Um, this is the alpha pair, probably scent marking, and the female will also engage in this scratching behavior to help mark their territory. And she is quite a scratcher. Um, coyotes are typically active year-round. They don't hibernate. In fact, um, none of the animals that we're going to be talking about tonight are hibernators. They, um, as I said, mate in late January, early February. The female is pregnant for about two months, and the pups are born in March or April. A typical litter is about uh, four to eight pups, and they will stay in the den until June, being nursed by the alpha female and fed by the alpha male and the helpers. Coyotes will typically den in very secluded locations, um, generally in the woods, in tree roots, in piles of rocks. Um, they like to be away from people. And if the den is disturbed in any significant way, the coyotes will often move the family to a secondary den site. Um, this uh, picture is one of the pups that I got last uh, spring probably just out of the den and beginning to explore. It's pretty unusual to see the pups, but if you do, um, you should know that adults are almost certainly close by, just like bears. Um, when the pups leave the den, they are brought by the pack to what's called a rendezvous site. Um, and so think of the rendezvous site as a little puppy training center. Um, they are typically open fields near the water with woods nearby, and um, basically the whole family just moves to the rendezvous site. They will sleep in the woods there, um, and the adults will begin to teach the pups to hunt for insects, and then they'll learn to hunt for mice, and then they'll learn to hunt for, um, you know, bigger, small mammals um, as they grow and, and begin to develop their skills. And then by fall, the pups will start traveling with the adults and hunting with them. They are nearly full size at this point. They're able to be um, independent by about six to nine months. And at that point, the pups start sorting things out. You know, are they going to go away or are they going to stay home with mom and dad? And so they either strike out looking for new territory or they stay with their parents in the original pack and become helpers. And that is largely a function of food supply. If the food supply is ample, they're more likely to stay. It's also a function of sibling rivalry. Are they getting along with the other coyotes in the pack? If not, they're likely to take off. And the pups that strike out become transient coyotes. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, packs live in territories. And um, the territory of an, an individual pack can vary in size. Um, averages about 10 uh, square miles. And that's the area where that one pack lives, breeds, hunts, 
um, and spends all of their time. The size of the territory is largely a function of food supply. And if I were to impose kind of a few hypothetical territories on Stowe, these are not actual territories. This is what it might look like. Um, the solid lines are the territory lines, and they can overlap at the edges. So the packs can kind of peaceably coexist at the edges of the territories and intersperse with each other. Um, and then within each territory, there's something called a core habitat, which is really um, the smaller area that belongs to the pack that they will defend. Think of it as um, the core being their house for you guys and the territory being that area in which you range on a daily basis. Um, pack members will typically hunt individually or in pairs. They will sometimes go off in larger family groups. And an individual coyote can travel as much as 10 to 15 miles a night as they go about their business of hunting. And so they disperse over these big territories. And the way that they communicate with each other um, is by howling. So you've probably heard coyotes howling at night. Howling can mean lots of different things. Sometimes it's just like, hey, I'm over here. Hey, I'm over here. Um, sometimes it's, hey, I've got food. Everybody come. Um, sometimes it's like, hey, we're just howling for fun because we can. Um, and so I, uh, one of the things that you'll hear people say sometimes is, wow, you know, I heard this pack of like 10 coyotes out in the woods howling. Well, they don't travel in packs of 10. And coyotes have this incredible ability to make it sound like there are more of them than they are. Um, and so they do this yip howling thing that's incredibly interesting and loud. And if I can, I'm going to play you a pretty incredible video that I found on the internet. And just like that, they stop. And you've probably heard that. OK. So what do coyotes eat? Um, the short answer is nearly everything. Coyotes are omnivores. They are very adaptable to different food supplies. They can live almost anywhere. Their preferred food is small mammals, voles, rabbits, squirrels, woodchucks. You see some of those being carried in these photos. They will also take young or weak adult deer. Um, they generally will not try to take a healthy deer unless they are really, really hungry. Um, coyotes also eat apples, berries, and other fruit. I have seen videos of coyotes leaping into the air and taking apples off of trees. And I have seen videos of coyotes actually up in the trees eating apples. So they are not really tree climbers, but they can jump up into the crotch of a tree and, and feed up there. Um, they will scavenge roadkill. They will go through garbage, um, eat livestock, birds, insects, reptiles, pets, pretty much they eat anything. They are most active from dusk to dawn. Uh, sometimes they are active in the early mornings, particularly if they haven't been able to get enough food overnight, they'll continue hunting in the morning. Um, and they are also active during the day when the pups are young. They're often out during the day with the pups. Oops. Last thing I want to talk about with regard to coyotes is transient coyotes. Um, we talked about packs, but the transient coyotes are the coyotes that are not part of packs. They are solitary. They roam over a much larger area that often spans several territories. Many of them are the pups that have grown, grown up and moved out. Um, transient coyotes are more likely to be seen during the daytime. They travel greater distances. They're more likely to get hit by cars. Um, and importantly, they are often waiting for a vacancy that happens in a pack, and they'll try to be accepted by the alpha in a pack uh, when a member of a pack dies or is killed. So they do serve as a source for kind of replenishing the coyotes of a pack. 
And then these are just some, uh, some cheesecake shots of our local coyote park. Some be big, beautiful animals in the winter. This um, animal in particular, every time it goes by my camera, gives it a little check out. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about foxes. Um, there are two kinds of foxes in Massachusetts, red foxes and gray foxes. Red foxes on the left are red. Gray foxes are also red, sort of. Um, you can see the red fox, I mean the gray fox coloration on the right. They can actually be difficult to tell apart, but red foxes tend to have a white tail tip and gray foxes tend to have a black tail tip and a little bit more of a tawny appearance you are much more likely to see red foxes. They are the foxes that are kind of out and about in neighborhoods. There's been a bunch of foxes hanging out right in the center of Stowe. Um, they might be out sleeping on your leaf pile. Um, they are out during the day quite commonly. Um, foxes are much smaller than coyotes, so seven to 15 pounds, a little bit smaller territory. They are vocal animals. They are shy, wary, and very curious. Um, like coyotes, they have a territory that's shared by a family group. And also like coyotes, they are omnivorous. Um, preferred diet is small rodents, insects, fruit, dead animals, birds. But they will actually eat vegetation, which is unusual. Um, and Foxes are really incredible hunters. They will leap straight up and bury their heads in the snow and come out with a mouse. And it's just amazing to think that they can hear that mouse down there under all that snow. Okay, the typical fox life cycle is very similar to coyotes. They breed in early in the year. Um, their dens are typically in the ground or under buildings, and they often have multiple entrances. Um, gray foxes are also excellent tree climbers, and they do sometimes den in trees. Um, foxes will typically have four pups, and like coyotes, the pups will stay with the adults, learning to hunt until they disperse in the fall. Foxes and coyotes are competitors uh, for food, and coyotes will not tolerate foxes in their core habitats. They will kill them if they come into core habitat. So they tend to separate spatially a little bit. Foxes are more likely to den close to houses, in fields, in brushy habitat. Coyotes are much more likely to den in the woods and away from houses. I don't have that many photos of foxes because I just have not seen very many of them. But this guy is about to enter coyote core habitat. So he's one very brave fox. Switching talk a little bit about fishers. Um, how many of you have actually seen a fisher? Wow, look at that. Cool. So fishers are not often seen. They're very shy. They're very solitary. Um, they are also found throughout Massachusetts, except on the islands. And they're generally in forested habitat. They are active both day and night. And um, they are actually a member of the weasel family. They're one of the largest members of the weasel family. Um, so they are not a cat. So when you hear people say fisher cat, mm -mm, it's a fisher. I just corrected someone today. <laughs> and uh, I should mention um, the males are about a third larger than the females. This is something called sexual dimorphism. And we'll talk about that again when we get to bobcats. But um, this is a very large male fisher. And then these are a couple of female fishers. The male's typically about three feet long. The females are about two feet long and about half the weight. They are dark brown to black in color. They have this little pointed face and round ears. And they move incredibly fast. More than any other animal, I am likely to just get the tip of the tail of the fisher on my camera because he's gone by so fast. Um, they have sharp claws. They are excellent tree climbers. Their life cycle is a little bit different than the other animals. They breed February into March. And they have, the females have something called delayed implement implantation, which means that the eggs get fertilized, but they stay dormant for 10 to 11 months. Um, when they finally implant, the kits are born about six weeks later. 
And then the female breeds again almost immediately and goes through another one of these delayed implantation cycles. Um, fishers have one to four kits. They're born helpless and blind. Generally, the den is high up in a tree where they'll stay for their first eight to 10 weeks. And then the female will move them to a new den at ground level where they'll remain with the mother until late summer, you know, learning to hunt, and then they will disperse. So fishers don't have packs. Um, and the males in the fisher world play no role in the raising of the kids. It's all on mom. Fishers are omnivorous, like coyotes. Um, they eat small rodents, squirrels, rabbits, birds. So you're hearing a theme here. Um, they will also eat fruit. I've seen a fisher in a compost pile scavenging for chicken. Um, and they are uniquely adapted to hunt porcupines. Fishers will take on a porcupine, kill it, and eat it. Um, they tend to avoid open areas, and they like to travel on high ground. So we have a number of these high eskers in stow, and you'll often find fisher tracks across them. And when I've tracked fishers, one of the things that you tend to see is that they will move along, and if there's a brush pile in their path, they'll leap on it to see what they can flush out, especially in the winter time. Okay, our last um, in the animal parade is the bobcat, um, or the bobtailed cat, as it's sometimes called. The bobcat is the only wild cat documented in Massachusetts, um, and it's about twice the size of a domestic cat. Bobcats also um, exhibit sexual dimorphism with the males being about a third larger than the females. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> um, and um, the tail can be up to a foot long, but it's usually shorter than that. Um, bobcats have these um, kind of yellowish, brownish, reddish brown bodies with black spots, and they also have kind of a prominent ruff around their neck and tufted ears. And like fishers, bobcats are solitary, they don't live or travel in packs, and they're probably the least likely to be seen um, just due to their numbers. Um, one of the things that they think about sexual dimorphism is that it serves a very key role for some of these animals because the males will are larger and they will take larger prey than the females. So they somewhat segregate in terms of their um, food supply. Um, cats will breed in um, February through March. They don't form any lasting pair bonds. So um, typically a male bobcat will have a territory that encompasses the territory of several females. So I kind of did a little graphic of that down below. There's just one female in each of those territories, one male. And um, one of the biggest challenges that bobcats have is finding each other during mating season because they're in these big territories, they're solitary, they're roaming around. Um, but when it does come time to mate, the male will try to mate with as many females as possible. And um, one author that I was reading about bobcats said, that bobcat courtship is a delicate phase in bobcat relationships in which two solitary and well-armed predators must come together in intimate contact without hurting each other. Um, these cats don't like each other. I mean, they mate because they have to. Um, and really, mating season is the only time that the female will tolerate the male being nearby. The young are born after about a two-month gestation, and um, they typically will have one to four kittens, uh, like fishers. They're born blind and helpless, and also like fishers, the male does not play a role in raising the kits. Um, so the, the female is forced to leave the kits and go out hunting to get her herself food, which is a time that the bobcats are vulnerable, the young bobcats, to predation by owls and hawks and other animals. Um, the kits stay with the mother into the winter, learning how to hunt, and eventually they'll separate and hunt on their own and begin to seek their own home ranges. Bobcats uh, are, tend to be most active from sunrise to s uh, either side of sunrise and sunset. So they're not as much nocturnal as they're crepuscular, as they call it. So they'll, they'll hunt late, they'll hunt early, but they'll sleep at night. 
Um, one of the things that bobcats have is incredible eyesight and incredible peripheral vision, which helps them in hunting. They rely on their ambush skills for hunting, so they'll just lay in wait for prey. Um, and if they miss, if they don't kind of catch their prey on the first leap, they'll only chase that prey about 50 feet. And if they don't get it, they'll wait for the next thing. They just, they don't spend a lot of time chasing. Same uh, kind of food supply, rabbits, mice, squirrels, birds. Um, bobcats will actually prey on deer, um, which they're really the only animal here that would prey on a healthy deer. Um, let's see. I don't have an opportunity to observe a lot of interactions among these animals, but um, I did get this series of photos of a bobcat and a coyote um, this coyote came along on the trail nine minutes after the bobcat. And so what you see in a whole series of photos is the coyote with its head down, sniffing the trail that the bobcat has left, and then just throwing back his head and starting to howl, which I think was meant to say, hey, this is my territory. Um, just wrapping up, I've kept one of my cameras stationary for this whole time, and um, I've recorded the number of animal crossings in front of the camera. So just to give you a sense of the prevalence of all of these different animals, um, the green jumpy line it are the number of coyotes that have passed in front of the camera. Um, and then the yellow is, is um, Fisher, the blue is um, Bobcat, and then the dark green is Fox. So it goes from a coyote passing by the camera multiple times in a day, um, or more likely multiple times in a night, um, the fisher a few times a week, the cats once or twice a month, and a fox a couple of times a year. I've only seen five foxes in a year and a half of watching a trail. Seventy-six times the coyote, coyotes passed in front of my camera that month. Yep, and it's because it, I can recognize individuals, but not always. I don't try to say, "Oh, that one went out, that one came back." I just count it as two. So, a couple closing points: all of these animals can be out during the daylight. Um, they all, as Sandra said, play an important role in regulating prey populations. All of them would prefer to avoid people which is why they are mostly out at night. Um, and I just wanted to say a word about mouse and rat poison. Um, so mouse and rat poison is a major threat to the animals that are at the top of the food chain, whether that's the animals that we've talked about tonight or whether it's hawks, owls, um, other bird predators. The chemicals that make up most mat mouse and rat poisons accumulate in those animals that eat mice and rats. And they are known as anticoagulants. They um, essentially can sicken and kill wildlife a couple of ways. The poisons can kill them directly if they ingest enough prey to build up enough of the anticoagulants in their system. And they will literally bleed to death from internal hemorrhaging. Or um, the rat poisons can weaken their immune systems and make them more susceptible to a parasitic mite that causes mange. So for those who haven't seen mange, um, this is a couple photos of a, a coyote with mange and a fox with mange that were both taken in stow. Um, mange causes the loss of fur. It causes infections. And animals that have mange are like scratching constantly, which makes it really difficult for them to hunt. Um, and they're really likely to die from either the infections or starvation or other complications of the mange. So please, if you have mice or rats, look for alternatives to poisons, sticky traps or other things, snap traps, um, and keep the predators alive that help keep them in check. So that's it for me. If you would like to look at photos of wildlife and you're not already following our Facebook page, um, that is where we post our best pictures. Or if you're not on Facebook, you can also find them on the wildlife sightings section of our website. Thank you and I'll turn it over to Mark. Hello, everybody. Um, 
As Kathy said, this, this talk came about because <clears throat> there are conversations on next door, and a lot of people have moved from the city out here, not realizing that they weren't moving to the suburban area, where, but they were moving to a uh, thriving ecosystem of huge <laughs> conservation areas and lots of orchards. And, um, and so people were um, posting, you know, I've seen a fox during the day, as if that's a bad thing, because they actually hunt during the day. But it, we wanted to do this to provide a lot of information. So I'm going to just give you um, what I would say is a lot of practical advice. Um, and I'm happy to take questions. But it, the um, strategy of dealing with predators has really changed from and evolved from let's kill them all um, to um, really coexisting with predators, even out west where there's huge you know, amounts of sheep and cattle, they're, they're adopting the same thing for a lot of practical reasons. And one is, if you kill a predator, then you have a new predator coming in that isn't familiar with the area, and you have more likely to have um, predator-human interactions, where if you have a stable ecosystem, it's much less likely. Um, so we just wanted to get the information out and have people really realize that they're not friends, they're not cute, cuddly things that you should go up and talk to, but at the same time, they're not enemies. They're part of the ecosystem, and given that, there's just some really practical things you need to do um, to coexist. And one of the things that I really want to drive home is wild animals are really rarely a threat to humans, especially in urban, suburban areas. Um, they're are, there's an abundance of predators all over Massachusetts, and it's very rare that there's any interaction between them. There's some practical things you do. If you have really young children, they probably shouldn't be out alone at dusk or dawn. Um, and you should teach your children to approach animals, or, or not to approach animals, um, even if they appear friendly, watch animals from a reasonable distance. Um, and never feed um, water or try to tame wild animals. Um, when I grew up, I had a, a neighbor who had a chipmunk that would come down and sit on his shoulder and pick peanuts out of his pocket, and we frown on that these days. Um, so there's a lot of things that you can do at home, and it's, it, it's just something to do. You know, Don't place garbage bags. Most people have the containers. Um, and the garbage containers should be animal proof. And if they're not, then they should go out the morning of pickup because um, it's just an easy way to avoid a conflict. Um, likewise, you need to clean your grills. If you leave um, a lot of grease and pieces of what you've grilled on the grill, somebody very likely is going to come and eat that. Um, and likewise with compost bins, you know, a lot of them are made so they're self-contained, but if you have a compost pile, it, would, it may make sense to think about putting it in a bin because otherwise you may be attracting um, any one of these predators. And as you see, they'll eat anything. And so if you're putting really good things in your compost, um, that's a really good way to attract predators. Likewise, feed your pets indoors. Um, a really big problem that has happened repeatedly is people feed their pets outdoors and then um, foxes or other predators will come and start eating that food. Um, and it is uh, a bad situation for both the predator and you. And, and, and look around and, and, and just realize that how you raise your house or what you do at your house is going to influence um, what predators you see. I personally like predators, so, um, so <laughs> some of these things like the dense uh, cover, ground cover, I am encouraging that so they feel comfortable in my yard, but if you don't want to encourage them, then look around for dense cover. Likewise, Fruit trees and gardens may attract wildlife, 
both in terms of the chipmunks that are going to eat your berries and the woodchucks that are going to eat everything. Um, but those will also attract predators. And, and so, again, thinking about ways, and I was at a, a house um, on Red Acre Road that had wonderful eight-foot fences around the entire yard. Um, and the person was moving, which is why I was there, and he had had a multi-year adventure trying to keep both deer and predators out of his, out of his yard. Finally, bird feeders and bird baths will att attract predators. And um, if you have uh, and see a lot of foxes or coyotes, because um, they will come and eat the seed, or they will come and eat the squirrels that are eating the seed, or the mice that are eating the seed, um, just be aware of it. And it's easy to clean, clean that up so there aren't piles of seeds that are going to attract a lot of rodents. Um, and the other thing is there was a um, situation last year where a black bear um, came through Stowe and, and ate a couple uh, bird feeders. And that happens in the fall, uh, typically when the young are leaving home and they don't have the same food sources. If you hear about it, it may make sense to take your bird fe feeder down for uh, a few weeks. Um, if bears are coming through. And protect your pets. Um, because uh, if you have small uh, pets, either cats or small dogs, um, they are at risk um, from some predators. So don't let them roam on their own free. Um, you need to uh, provide a safe enclosure and you have to recognize that um, fences aren't going to keep most predators out. And so it makes sense to make sure you're taking care, care of your small dogs so they don't run off. And um, if you have cats, if, they, if they're outside cats, you're taking a risk because this is an ecosystem that's thriving and does have uh, predators and you may lose your cat. And the way, obviously, to deal with that is an inside cat. Um, again, make sure your pets are um, up on their shots. Um, you wouldn't want your cat or dog to get rabies if they happen to have an encounter with um, a rabid animal. And that could be just as likely a raccoon or something other than a predator. Um, and finally, if you have pet birds, um, and my stepson has a canary, um, they should always be contained if they're outside. Otherwise, they're at risk of being eaten. Oops. Um, more things you can do. Um, not too many people have pet doors these days. But if you do, they need to be locked. Um, chin chimney caps will help you avoid having squirrels, but also larger animals go down your, your chimneys. Clean the gutters so there isn't a lot of debris. Um, there's vents in various places up on the roof in the higher parts of your house. And they should have really strong um, fencing, uh, hardware cloth, to prevent animals from coming in. Um, you can get bats and other um, critters living in your house if you don't take these steps. Um, likewise, um, dryer vents uh, need proper exclusion devices. And secure basement vents and hatch doors. I did have a skunk come into my basement and go into the um, washing machine, which was an adventure to get it out without spraying. Um, and so all these things can happen if you live in a thriving environment. And I think that's why we live in Stowe, is because it is exciting and it is interesting to see these animals. Um, obviously, observe predators from a safe distance and make sure that your children understand that that's what they should be doing as well. Generally, they're fearful of humans. Um, 
you know, foxes in particular, if they hear humans, they will go away. Um, but if there are predators that you don't want in your yard, making noise is the easiest way, waving your arms, stomping your feet, um, to get them to go away. Um, I've scared a bear by going boo really loudly, and it works, it works great. So, um, and, and they will change their direction when they hear people. Uh, but there are a number of devices that you can buy. Um, I had a friend who decided to climb all the 4,000 footers, and he was scared of bears. So he had a pole with a bear bell on it. Um, and he never got attacked by a bear on all the 4,000 footers. So, um, but there's bears, there's horns. Um, and as I said before, despite having um, predators throughout Massachusetts, there's very rarely um, any reported uh, incidents where they actually attack people. Um, protecting livestock and poultry. Um, one of the things that people should know is chicken wire is to keep chickens in, not to keep predators out. So you really need to have stronger fencing if you want to try to raise chickens because um, a lot of predators can tear through chicken wire. Um, and there are portable electric fencing designed for poultry if you want to move them around your yard. Um, and the electric shock will keep predators away. Um, again, ra keep just thinking about what predators do. Um, a lot of predators can uh, dig underneath, and so you do. It's better to raise the coop up off the ground, and to um, have the coop not near a tree where. A predator can be over uh, your poultry or livestock. Um, and if you're doing fencing, you have to remember that a lot of these predators can dig and they will dig under fencing. So you need at least 12 inches into the ground um, to make sure that they don't come in. Um, and it's good to train your animals to return to the barn or the coop every evening and make sure they're locked up securely at night. Because as you heard from Kathy, nights when most of these animals are most active. Um, some other things just to think about, and it's all common sense. You know, if you have feed, make sure it's locked up and secured. Um, likewise, if you spill feed, pick it up. Um, and there are noise devices, so if somebody has chickens and, and um, want and have a predator problem, there's a number of different devices. This critter getter um, it acts like one of those remote lights, so it's, it's sensitive to movement and it will go on and make noise if something comes within the area. Um, and if you have a predator problem, it's probably because some husbandry practices need to be improved. But you can turn on the radio, and you can put clothes that smell like humans, you know, go for a run and leave, leave your tracksuit outside. And it really will um, act as a deterrent to the predators coming around. And those are the suggestions I have. And um, I encourage you to continue enjoying seeing predators in stow. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't have a nice slideshow, <laughs> but I do have uh, just a few things to say. Um, I'd like to start with talking about keeping cats and dogs um, around wildlife. As pet owners, we have to be very vigilant about the wildlife that's around us. Wildlife was here before our pets, and we have to respect that. Um, whether it's day or night, a very close eye needs to be kept on our pets. Many residents feel if they let their cats out during the day, and as long as they're in by night, they're safe. If I have this conversation with someone, generally, unfortunately, a few weeks later, they come down with a, an unknown scratch on the pet, and the pet ends up being put in quarantine, 
because it has a wound of unknown origin. Um, so it's never okay to leave any animals outside unattended, whether it's daytime or nighttime. Um, predators can come mm -hmm. from both on the ground and in the air. Um, in the past, not in this town, but in a town just two towns away, um, there was a gentleman at his lake house and he had two Yorkshire Terriers mm -hmm. and they started barking and one of them started yelping and he came around the side of the house where the dogs were and there was a hawk that had one of the, do um, one of the dogs. The hawk didn't get very high because of the weight of the dog, um, but he was taking off over the lake and he was just barely hovering over the water. The man ran out into the water yelling and screaming, waving his hands, and the hawk did drop the dog who survived with just some minor talon injuries. Um, but it's not just the small dogs. Um, I had a neighbor just up the street from me that's got a mastiff. He was out for his last call at night in the backyard. Um, behind the yard is an open farm field. The floodlights were on on the house. The dog was out real quick just to do his quick pee and uh, he uh, it was very quiet. They had taken a look before letting him out into the yard. Um, he was on a leash so he was contained. The dog started barking. He came inside with wounds on him and the coyote was taken off. Um, again, the dog survived, but these things happen very quick. Um, wildlife encounters can happen any time of day. So be sure to keep your cats, um, this was kind of mentioned before, up to date on um, cats, dogs, and ferrets, up to date on rabies shots. Um, it's actually a state law. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is how to identify sick wildlife. Um, this was also kind of touched on. Um, just because they're out during the day doesn't mean they're sick. We often get calls. I saw a raccoon go through the yard and it's got to be sick. It's out during the day. Um, they do come out during the day. Um, generally, they are out at dusk, overnight, and um, early morning. However, they can be out during the day and healthy. Sometimes they can be scared out of their dens from noises, whether it's from people or other animals. They also may come out during the day if they don't get anything to eat the night before. If you were like they were and you went out to catch your food and you got to eat every day and you find nothing to eat, you may come out during the day to eat. Um, we saw pictures of uh, foxes that have mange, and um, mange is the hair loss. However, that does not necessarily mean they're rabid. They don't necessarily go hand in hand. Things to watch for to determine if an animal is sick, um, one or more of the following. Uh, loss of balance. They go, say, I see it, I've seen it a lot in raccoons and skunks. They're walking along and they just tip to one side. They may not hit the ground, they may just wobble over and then get back up and try to walk some more and stumble again. Um, that's a sign of rabies. They may be very aggressive, attacking things that don't make sense. A an empty trash can lashing out at the tree doesn't make sense. So they can be aggressive or they could be very docile. They could just be laying around. You walk past it, didn't quite see it. You make a lot of noise to try to make them leave. They don't leave. There's a good chance that they're, that they're sick. Um, they can walk in large circles, 10, 12 feet. I've seen them do this in the street, around and around with no directions. Rabies is a central nervous um, disease, so it, they don't have balance and they have a very bad sense of direction. If you see any of these symptoms, please call your local police department and we will get it taken care of. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is when to call animal control and how to do it. If you feel an animal is rabid, if you find or see a loose pet or loose livestock, if you need to report that your animal is missing, if you have questions about wildlife, if you feel a pet is in danger, if you have a pet um, come in contact with you or that has bitten or scratched a pet, um, then you need to call the police department. If you wish to reach animal control, it's all done through the police department. All the animal calls are logged in through there they then dispatch out an officer immediately, depending on what's going on, and for myself to follow up so you'll get a phone call or a visit from one or both of us. Thank you. Um, okay, so Kathy has um, a really cool video of otters, and then um, after that, um, we don't want you to forget about the handouts that we have. There's a really cool thing that I got from Mass Wildlife um, that's uh, a pocket guide to animal tracks and he has <laughs> the, 
The man who asked the question, grab one, which is great, so all of you, if you want to grab one, it has all the different um, track patterns and, um, and prints for all sorts of neat little wildlife. And then it has this ru ruler on the side so you can, when you're on the, on the field in the fresh snow, you can kind of measure the size and then have a look-see about what it might be, so. There you go. All right, really quick, and thank you all for being great uh, audience tonight. Um, if someone would turn down the lights, that would be helpful. So uh, I think folks know that we were lucky enough to discover um, an otter hole on one of our conservation areas. And um, we've had a camera out there watching these otters since a little bit before Christmas. Um, they've been extremely active. They are so much fun to watch. Um, some of you may have seen our sliding into Monday video on our Facebook page, which has these otters just sliding down a huge snow-covered hill. And there's so many videos that I get every time I go to the camera that I can't show them all. But Stowe TV made a great um, otter video that's been online um, to music. Thank you. And this one is hot off the presses. The whole family. <laughs> very fun to watch. <laughs>